without ever even opening GDB, which was kind of the point of the whole hack. Uh, that you learn proper debugging, setting, uh, you know, uh, isolating a bug down to a, per, uh, a certain area, uh, testing your theory by uh, setting a breakpoint and running up to that area and looking at the variables and then looking really hard at the code and, and walking through step by step so that you see what's wrong. And so I want to take this as an opportunity since you sent me such a beautiful bug uh, that I want to uh, take a look at that bug and remind you about the good uses of GDB. So first of all, uh, I tried to reproduce it as much as possible. You saw me like tinkering around up here, trying to get it to actually seg fault because uh, it only seg faults if, uh, like all undefined behavior, and the perennial uh, uh, the statement that we get when we uh, when asked for when when people ask us for help, it works on my computer, but it doesn't work on the grader. Well, that's because it's undefined behavior, and it, if uh, if it's undefined, it can do anything it wants. Right? It could work on your computer 50 times in a row, and then the 51st time it'll actually crash because of how memory might be loaded up for that particular point in time. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to, I, I'm tr I didn't reproduce this bug here exactly, uh, but there, uh, it, it's essentially what, uh, uh, what, he, uh, what he showed me. Uh, he was trying to, of course, do assignment four, which you should all start on because it is due in about two and a half weeks, uh, and it deals with fi uh, strings and file I.O. Uh, but here's basically, uh, and I'm not, I'm not giving anything away by what you uh, showed me, but uh, this is basically code that we went over on Monday, uh, where we're, we were reading a file line by line uh, using forgets, where, uh, where we read line, then the next line, then the next line. So let's just walk through this part. And I've, I've got another part up here because I want to remind you about another tool that you might have forgotten about now. Uh, but, but let's go ahead and take a look at this. First of all, we open up this file named foo. Uh, and I, I just filled it out with a, in with a bunch of random letters, A, B, C, D, E, F. That's not important. What is important is uh, we, we've created, uh, he, he, uh, th we then create a, a string here, a dynamic string. S is dynamic because we are calling malloc. So that's being allocated somewhere on the heap. Okay? Then we've got a static array here, a static string of size 100, so it's able to hold a string of what length uh, at most? 99, because we need to put in that null terminating character. Likewise, 99 up here. But neither one of these is initialized. So what's in there is anybody's guess. It's dead beef. It's undefined. But that, that's not the bug. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to get that first line. I'm calling forgets on that line, and I'm capturing the return value over here. Because remember, the way that you tell that you're at the end of the file is that forgets will tell you, I'm at the end of the file. Here's null. Right? It'll return null, and there will, uh, won't be any changes to this buffer right here. This is a buffer that we're temporary, temporarily uh, reading stuff into. So I'm going to go into a while loop here. While s is not null, in other words, while I've not reached the end of the file, I will read the next line. I'll go ahead and copy it over into this other thing. This is, this is me trying to force it to, be, uh, uh, to have a seg fault, because it wasn't before. Because it was perfectly fine having me corrupt my own memory. Uh, so I'm, try I, I, I'm trying to get it to a point where I'm corrupting other people's memory so that I force it to a seg fault. And then I print it out to make sure that it w uh, it's correct, and then I increment i. Well, this was dynamic memory up here. So in general, if you create dynamic memory, you need to clean up after yourself uh, and go ahead and free it up. right? So let's go ahead and walk through. You might see the bug immediately. I, uh, uh, the, the reason I called this a beautiful bug was because I sat there and stared at it for five minutes, and I couldn't get it. And I said, oh, what, what's going on? I don't see it. It's not obvious. It's very, very subtle. So I had to fire up GDB. I went line by line. And finally, I found out what was wrong. But it was only because I used a tool like GDB. Right? And this is, this is my point, that if you did not use GDB on Hack9, you are not picking up an extremely valuable skill. Just like if you're not using Git, uh, Git or GitHub or GitLab, whatever you want, even though you got through that first hack and you got through that first assignment, yeah, OK, whatever, I, 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 I finished that. Those are skills that you're going to need for the next four years in, in, in uh, not only in a, uh, this program, if you're if CS and CE and moving on, but also in your, in your daily, uh, not daily lives, but in your professional lives. These are tools that are used on an almost daily basis when you're actually doing things. Now, not necessarily GDB. Uh, unless you're, unless you're uh, daily programming in C or something like that. But every language is going to have some sort of a debugger. Right? So let me go ahead and uh, 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 compile this. 
uh, and I've used the G flag. And I'll show you that, well, here's the uh, contents of that, uh, that foo file line, and then A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And so it should print all those out, but it doesn't. It goes into a segmentation fault. Now, just by looking at this, it's not going to tell me what's going on, right? It's not going to tell me that it's corrupted at a certain line. That's why I have to use GDB to run it. And now, again, it's still not going to tell me. But if I do a backtrace, right, and even if I do a backtrace full, it'll print all the variables and stuff like that. I just want a simple backtrace. And it tells me that it happened on line 30. That at least gives me a clue of where to start. So I'll go ahead and break at line 30 and run the program again. Right? Now, there's the line, right? String copy S. Right? Uh, all right, well, what, what's, what, maybe I'm going out of the uh, bounds of I. What's I? Right? All right, it's 0. So it happened on the first iteration here. OK. Uh, well, what's S? Right? Well, it's A. So that was the second line. So it's, uh, it's happening on the first iteration, second iteration. I don't know what's going on here. So let me go ahead and go out layout next so I can actually look at the full program here. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I, I'm, I've, I'm stopped here at 30. Okay. So why is it uh, seg faulting out at foo sub i? Uh, so print foo sub i. Right? You can do this. And uh, that's, uh, that's the null terminating character, and it repeats 99 times. So I got lucky, and it initialized it correctly. So there's nothing wrong with foo. Right? Uh, and in fact, it's big enough to hold this string. If I print out s, OK, well, it's just a and then an endline character. So why, why, why is this happening? What's wrong with this thing? Right? So next, all right, uh, it, it, it's fine now. Next, next. All right, so it wasn't the first iteration. Right? Why? Because I was able to get past all that. Now re refresh. Right? OK. So maybe it's not, uh, I mean, uh, maybe it's not, any, uh, uh, let's see. I, I don't remember how to fast forward. Uh, break if i is equal to, and I forget how many lines there are, but I'm going to fast forward to 8. Right? Uh, there we go. Break at line 23 if, uh, if i is equal to uh, uh, 8. Now I'm what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue. Right? And print i. OK, well, I've got this other breakpoint here, so clear. 30, there we go. Uh, and continue, right. refresh, there. So segmentation fault, what, 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 what uh, oops, uh, darn it, OK. Uh, in my haste to try to get this to break, it's actually not breaking the way that I wanted to now. Darn it. All right, so let's, let's emax this. Forget about copying it for now. We'll just print it out. GCC, run this. And uh, I'm still not getting it, unfortunately. Well, so I'll show you. Uh, I'll still show you GDB here. GDB, All right? Layout next, and break at main, so I can actually see it. Right. Run. Uh, okay. Uh, well, there's there's another issue here that I want to look at later, but I want to look at uh, this part here first. So let's go ahead and go down to break at line 34. Now I'm going to continue all the way through. And I should not get a segmentation fault, but uh, you know it screws up, so I'll refresh. All right. Now, at this point, this is where the bug actually is, freeing this up. Now, the person that sent this bug to me, uh, it was manifesting itself a little bit differently. It was uh, saying that uh, 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 there was a free corruption, right? Uh, that this, uh, and th this is why, I'm, uh, I, unless I copied his entire program and ran it here, I didn't want to do that to, because he had a pretty good solution already. Uh, so I only took a snippet, and unfortunately, I'm not able to reproduce it 100%. But this is the bug right here. Now, if you can tell what this is, then you are better than me, because this stumped me for a while. Okay? Uh, but uh, the only way that I was able to find this was by going up to this point and then starting to print things out. Well, OK, well, maybe what, what's, what's at S? OK, that's null at this point. Uh, weird. What, uh, what about print, uh, let's see, uh, line? OK, well, that's the last line. right? And this makes sense because s is, uh, to break out of this while loop, s would have to be null. And this is why I'm not reproducing his error entirely. right? So what's the problem here? What am I about to do? I'm about to free s, which is, what was it again? Null. Right? So can you free the null pointer? No. If I go next, 
then uh, uh, it's not manifesting itself right now, uh, but that's because I'm not corrupting my memory. If I had a more complex program, uh, then it would actually start segfaulting here. Okay? Uh, so uh, let me quit out of this and show you what his bug was actually doing by adding another thing here. Free line. There we go. Oh, wow. Uh, the, G, uh, the, the GCC compiler, maybe this is Clang, I'm not sure which one it is, but the GCC compiler is even smart enough to catch this bug as a warning before I even go into this thing. I'm going to have to go back to his, uh, to his submission and see if he was actually getting this warning. I, I, I don't remember if he was or not, but that's, really, that's a really good uh, uh, warning there. So what, well here, let's look at the warning. What was the warning? Attempt to free a non-heap object line. Right? So now I'll remind you, what is S? S is a dynamically allocated string. It's allocated on the heap. You do need to free it up. And so freeing it up down here, as long as I uh, didn't lose uh, reference to it, that would have been fine. But what about line? Line is a static array. Where is it allocated again? On the stack. Can you free up the stack? Not without, can you, if you've got your stack of dishes, can you rip something out and break the plate? Well, yeah, but what happens to the rest of your dishes on top of it? They all fall down, right? So no, you cannot uh, free something that's on the stack. And this is what he uh, ended up doing, but he, it, was, it, was hit, it was hidden because he was using a, a more of a for loop and uh, a couple of other things. And it was not apparent at all that he was leaking memory here. This is a memory leak as well. We uh, create this in memory. And then what do we do immediately on this line down here? We lose it uh, by uh, calling forgets and capturing that, uh, that pointer value. Originally, s was pointing to something on the heap over there. And now what is it pointing to? Now it's pointing to something on the stack. That memory over there is lost to a memory leak. Right? So the only way that you're going to find this and diagnose this stuff is by using a tool like GDB, because you would never even have noticed on what line it is. Right? Not only that, but I really, it seems like everybody forgot that on uh, lab seven, we showed you a, another tool called, if you remember when you were doing the lab on arrays, that first part where we demonstrated a memory leak, uh, we had you run this program. Do you remember what that program was called? It sound, it's a cool name. Valgrind, right? So I've, uh, I've already compiled this. Uh, let me, uh, let's, let's take a look at the code here, uh, because it, I made it really obvious. Uh, but a lot of times, memory leaks are not, all, uh, not at all obvious. For example, this memory leak here is not at all obvious. This memory leak is definitely obvious. I am creating a, uh, an integer array here of 1,000 elements. Then I'm setting one of them. I'm setting another one. Is this valid right there? Am I, uh, if, I, if, if I set the 1,000th element, the index at 1,000, is that correct? No. This is correct. That's the last element. What am I doing here? I'm accessing something that's beyond the scope of the array. So I'm, I'm committing two bugs here. I'm accessing the, something that's not in the array, but also, did you clean up after yourself? No. Did you return it? No. So what happens to these 1,000 times uh, 4 bytes, 4,000 bytes here? Memory leak, right? And down here, I'm calling it 10 times. So how much memory am I leaking? 4,000 bytes times 10 iterations is going to be? something around 40,000 bytes. Right? And I would never notice this because if I run it, well, uh, oops, now, now it's doing it. <laughs> uh, geez, uh, yeah, let, let's get rid of that so that it actually runs. Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and get rid of this and get rid of this. Again, undefined behavior. It'll just show up in weird uh, places. Right? And, and maybe if I ran that again, it wouldn't even do that. Right? There we go. Run it again, run it again, run it again, run it again. All right, I got rid of that segmentation fault. But I have no indication that I'm leaking memory. The only way that I'm going to do that is by running valgrind. Let's go up here. I had it set up already. And for that, you can either go back to your lab 7 to see how to run valgrind, or in, uh, in um, the main course page, we've got a troubleshooting guide. This troubleshooting guide says, if you get in trouble, here are the fault. Uh, if, you, if you have a problem with your program, here are the steps to follow. The very first one is unit testing. You need to come up with something that breaks your code. Because if you don't have something that breaks your code, then it looks like it works. There's nothing to investigate if, it, if everything looks like, it, uh, like it's working. Right? And then when it breaks in the greater, because we're using different test cases and different unit tests, 
then, uh, th then you're lost because it's a black box tester. You can't look at our stuff. Okay? So let me go ahead and run this. And again, it, uh, w one of the reasons people don't uh, really appreciate this tool right away is because it does look like a wall of text. But what is it telling me? Uh, 100 bytes in block one are definitely lost in loss of record one of three. Uh, 40,000 bytes, that sounds familiar, uh, in 10 blocks are definitely lost in record three of three. Well, where did I lose those? I, lost, uh, I allocated them in main, which called bar. So it, ultimately, it happened on line seven. That gives me a hint as to where I need to go to find out where the memory leak is. Right. On line seven, what am I doing? There it is. That's where I'm allocating it. Now, it's not going to tell me where I don't deallocate, because it doesn't know. Right? If, it, if it knew the ideal place in your program that this memory should now be cleaned up, you would have a, what's called a garbage collector. And you'd have a garbage collector that took care of all that stuff for you. There are many languages that do that, many modern languages like Java. Uh, or PHP or JavaScript, right? Uh, they all take care of memory management for you. C is not like that. C, you have to take care of your own stuff. So 1,000 1, integers times 4 bytes each times 10 iterations, that's 40,000 bytes lost. And oops, and Valgrind was able to find out where I allocated that stuff on line 7. And now I can go back and say, OK, well, I use it, I, I allocate it here. It's used here, and then I'm done with it here. That's where I need to free it up. Right? Let me go ahead and do that, right? and say that we'll free it up in this, uh, in this function like he right here. Free array. Run this again. Run valgrind again. And guess what? Those 40,000 bytes are now cleaned up. There's no longer a memory leak. Right? Now, there's still a memory leak here. In fact, there are two records of memory leaks. What are they? Uh, there's 100 bytes lost, and uh, where? On line 25. What line was that? Line 25 is right there, right? Because I never cleaned it up. OK, well, let's go ahead and restore that. Right? That's what was causing the bug, because why? Well, s is going to get a re a reassigned to a different value, null. So this is not the fix. Just cleaning it up is not necessarily the fix, because when I actually run this, let's see if I can reproduce the error. Nope, 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 nope. Perfect. Well, now it's not gonna uh, now it's not gonna do it for me, right? uh, But Valgrind will say that I'm no longer uh, I know I'm still losing that memory because uh, I didn't uh, I cleaned up the wrong thing. I cleaned up a different dangling. Uh, these are called dangling pointers. Uh, when you have something that points to a memory location, uh, here's a big chunk of memory, and here's my pointer. It's pointing to this memory location, and then I point it somewhere else, right? This is a dangling pointer because it's no longer pointing to the original memory that I actually need to clean up. I've lost that. It's a memory leak. So definitely 100 bytes lost there. Uh, I can't believe that it's not detecting uh, leak check full, leak checks all kinds. Let's do all kinds. Maybe it'll give me the other. Er, there. Now I've got a, a full report here. One blo oh, 552 blo blocks are still reachable in lost record of 2 of 2, where on line 24. Oh. Line 24. Oh, that's this. This is probably no. That's static. Uh, line 24. Oh, <laughs> brilliant! I love that. What's it telling me? I opened the file, but what did I do? I didn't close it. Valgrind is really smart. It's finding all of my errors today. Right? But you need to use these tools. the The first time you see a tool, right? Uh, and, and, and unfortunately, to, to simplify it down to a stupid idea. The first time you see a hammer, if you've never seen a nail before, you can't really appreciate what the hell it's good for. But once you see a nail, once you see a hammer, and once you put to start to put together a box, then you start to think, yeah, this is a pretty damn useful tool. Right? But you only understand that after a certain context. So make sure that you're going back to what, you've, what we've covered and what we've learned and what we've used uh, throughout the semester and think, you know what? Uh, that, I didn't really appreciate GitHub in the first uh, week or two. But you know what? I'm copying my files back and forth. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, collaborating with somebody on a hack, and uh, we're passing a thumb drive back and forth to each other. Gee, there's got to be a better way. Well, yeah, there is a better way, GitHub. right? So make sure that you are looking. Uh, th this is all computing is, folks. Computing is nothing more than relieving the uh, arduous, stupid tasks, repetitive tasks that humans do. 
Uh, this, is, this is automation. This is robotics. This is computing. Right? If you're wasting a bunch of time copying files back and forth, yeah, there's got to be a way, better way. Yes, there is a better way. You use GitHub, and then you push and pull so that you're not copying everything. And you have a full record of stuff. Uh, learning to use, you know, to go back to the original analogy, if you never really appreciate the purpose of a hammer, you're just pounding in a nail with your hand. Right? Don't do that. Right? Don't do that manual work. Okay? So make sure that you're using the full array of tools that we've given you. Okay? All right. So one of those other tools that I'm going to give you today is a much better way of doing things with respect to real world objects. Okay? Uh, so we're going to be looking at uh, encapsulation, not objects, sorry, that's a typo. Right? So uh, built in built in primitive types, primitive primitive types, such as int, double, or char, uh, are limiting. Right? Uh, not everything is a simple number uh, or character. Right? Real world entities, and by entities we mean things, nouns, person, places, things, right, are, uh, are made up of multiple pieces of data. Right? For example, in the lab that you just did, lab 10, you were sorting a bunch of teams by, uh, you know, baseball teams by, um, I think you did reports, uh, various reports, or the, we, we did the reports for you, right? Uh, you sorted a bunch of teams by salary, uh, sorted a bunch of teams by name or city, right? Uh, refresh my memory because I forget too. What was it? By their win percentage, thank you, right? So uh, if, you, if you really took a look at that code, that was terrible code, right? And it was terrible code for a reason. Did anybody look and see how the teams were actually represented? Baseball teams. Baseball teams. Right. So I'm just going to go into code mode here, and let's talk about that for a second. Right? What was a baseball team? You had a name, right? and I won't initialize this. You had a number of wins. Right? You had num losses. Maybe you had, like, um, I don't know. Uh, a salary, uh, a, 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 a total salary a budget. Uh, maybe you had the city that it's in. You had a bunch of other things. Let's just go ahead and keep it simple and say that we've got these three things. For example, we have the great Expos, who hopefully will win tonight. Right? Uh, nobody, nobody watch, watches baseball. Right? And if you really watch baseball, you know what I'm talking about there. Right? They're the Nationals, right? They're, they were the Expos. Uh, I forget, how many wins did they have? Any Nationals fans in here? Any Expos fans? I, I think that they moved before most of you were born. Uh, so let's go ahead and say that they were a 90-win team and a 70-loss team, lo uh, 70 loss team or something like that. All right, well, that's great. That's one team. Now, how do I represent another team? Well, that's name one, name two, num losses one, num losses two. This is a terrible, terrible programmer doing this job. Astros. And uh, I think that they won over 100 games, 107. Thank you. And so therefore, they would have lost 55. Uh, there's always 162 games in the modern baseball era. OK, uh, well, let's pick the best baseball team. Exactly, Cubs. Uh, unfortunately, what were they, 89? And. Uh, then that would be 60 or 73 lost team, right? Not too bad, but <laughs> not good enough. Oh, and then of course, what do I need to do? Three, 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 right? And there are, 30, uh, there are 27 other baseball teams to do this for. Cut, paste, cut, paste, cut, paste. Good idea? Bad idea. Bad idea. Instead, what I should be doing is probably making an array for each one of these things. A character array for names, right, where there are 30 baseball clubs and at most 100 characters each. Uh, and then uh, int uh, num losses, right, 30, ba uh, 30 uh, team records, and int num wins for thir uh, 30. Oops, there we go. Right. That's a little bit better. Let me go ahead and get rid of all that. That's a little bit better in that I don't have 30 uh, times 3, 90 different variables but I still have three arrays. Every time I sort it by, say, their win percentage, 
what am I going to have to do to all three of those records? If, this, if, if the Astros, uh, they have a better win percentage than the Expos, what do I need to do? Uh, and, they're, and they're out of order. I need to swap their names. I need to swap their losses. I need to swap their, win, uh, their, their wins. What if I come in and have cities, states, zips, uh, salary caps, uh, all, this kind of, uh, all these things that define a team, and I've got now 10, 20, 30 different arrays. Every time I want to sort it, I have to go through and sort 30 different ones by one of them, uh, one of the others. Right? Does this seem like a, better, a slightly better solution, but does this seem like an ideal solution? No. Instead, what should I do? I want something that represents a team. That team is going to have a name. That team is going to have a number of wins. And that team is going to have a number of losses, right? as well as a bunch of other things. Now I've got one thing, right? I've got one entity that represents a real world thing, right? Uh, like uh, uh, people, right? People have a first name, last name, date of birth, whatever, 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 uh, and all, the, uh, all that kind of stuff. I want to encapsulate all that th stuff into one unit. I want to create a new type. It's not a string. It's not an integer. It's not a, num it's not a simple number. It's a collection of things that has been collected together into one unit, one thing. Right? We call that encapsulation, collecting all that stuff and putting it into one thing. We're encapsulating all those aspects together. Okay? Now, how do we do that? That's the motivation. Right? Uh, that uh, it, it, it is a bad idea to represent uh, real world entities by separate pieces of data. Ideally, those pieces of data should be collected into one unit or one thing or one entity. Right? In C, uh, in C, that, ent uh, that entity is a structure. Structure. There we go. Uh, not like a building structure or anything like that, uh, but a structure. It's, it's structured data if you want to look at it like that. All right. This is called. Uh, this is uh, generally referred to as encapsulation. Right. Now, really, at the end of the day, encapsulation is three things. Let me give myself some more room here. Encapsulation uh, includes the one, the grouping, grouping of data, two, the protection of data, and not, not protection in the sense that it's secure data and that we encrypt it or anything like that. It's the protection of data from bad designs. Uh, by, uh, by design, you're not allowed to screw up the, the name of this baseball team. You're not allowed to name the nationals, the expos, like I would like to, right? Uh, instead, you need to uh, in, in, instead you need to do it uh, uh, through a very controlled manner. All right, and three, the grouping of functionality that acts on that data. Right? Now, encapsulation is an OOP idea. Right? This is object-oriented programming. Right? Object-oriented programming. C came along before object-oriented programming. Uh, about 10, 15 years before object-oriented programming. Uh, object-oriented programming is a different type of paradigm, where uh, C is usually referred to as structured programming or imperative programming, where you write a program and you just say that you do this thing, then do this thing, then do this thing, call that function over there to change the state of the program. You know, you read it uh, top to bottom, left to right. Uh, Object-oriented programming is very, very similar at the end of the day, but it takes a different approach. It takes a different uh, design approach. Instead of having everything be imperative, you d uh, first you start out by defining your objects. Your objects have behavior. This is a team, and this is what a team does. Uh, that's a person, and that's what a person is, and that's what a person does. And once you then uh, then you once you define these two things, you can just start. Uh, defining the interactions between them. This person is a player on this team, and so therefore it gives them some sort of behavior. This person is an owner of this team, and so it gives it different kinds of behavior. And that's what object-oriented programming is. C is not object-oriented programming. Object-oriented programming came later on. C, uh, in fact, uh, all the, the, the main object-oriented programming languages that were born first are derivatives of C. 
Uh, one of the first object-oriented programming languages, at least from the 80s, they, they pre uh, predate this kind of, um, like, mm, what was it called? I forget, I forget the uh, programming language off the top of my head, but uh, one of them was C. What, what's the next one? What it comes after C? Not D, but C++. All right? uh, and why? What's, what's the plus plus? Well, it's a joke. I++, plus plus, right? The next I. Well, C++ plus plus is just the next C. Uh, the original name for it, that was just a joke that he came up with later on. The original name for it was C with classes. Uh, and so you could define these objects. In fact, uh, it was just uh, the, the very first versions of C++ were nothing more than a transliterator that took the C++ language, translated it into C, and then used a C compiler to actually generate the uh, machine code. Uh, another uh, competing one was what? What else came from C? C sharp. Uh, before we talk about that one, but there's another one before that. Anybody done any uh, Mac OS programming back in the day, at least five, ten years ago? No? Obje objective C. Well, what is the objective for? It's object oriented C. Uh, nobody really programmed and re never really ca caught on beyond uh, iOS programming. In fact, nobody w wanted to use it anymore, so they developed what other language now do you use for iOS programming? Oh, nobody does any? Swift. Right? They created a different programming language because Objective C, nobody liked it. Uh, and then everybody said C, uh, C sharp. Why, why do they call it C sharp, I wonder? Sharp. So, any musicians in here? Yeah. All right, so what are, the, uh, what are the notes? A, B, C, then what's next? Yeah, uh, where, well, okay. A, B, uh, dot, dot, dot. Uh, C, down here. Uh, here's C, what's down here? C flat. Then C, then what's above it? C-sharp, right? So it's just stupid jokes all the time, right? Uh, but the, the, the C-sharp as in well, how do you write a C, a, uh, how do you write a sharp uh, when, when you only have a QWERTY keyboard? That thing right there, right? All right, so you can see that a lot of uh, C gave a lot of birth to a lot of these programming languages. Even Java owes a lot to C because it's C-style syntax. Uh, you've got curly brackets denoting code blocks. You've got uh, semicolons ending it, et cetera, et cetera. Unfortunately, C does not support full encapsulation. It only has weak encapsulation. Right? I don't know if that's an official term or not, but that's what I call it. It only supports number one. Right? Number one being the grouping of data. There are conventions to try to protect data. Uh, for example, uh, be, uh, beginning a, a, a variable with, the, uh, uh, with an underscore, that's kind of a big hint that you should not be using this variable, that this is an internal variable. I'm trying to protect it. Please don't touch it, right? But if you touch it anyway, well, then it, that's, your, that's on you now. Right? That's undefined behavior as far as the uh, library is concerned. The grouping of functionality that acts on that data can also be technically achieved in C through function pointers. But it is so much so that you have to bend over backwards, uh, you nearly break your back in, in order to try to do, uh, to, to do it. So that's why we say that C really only supports number one, the grouping of data right, together. Okay? C does this through, fun, uh, through, uh, uh, through uh, uh, structures. Right? So defining structures. So here's my goal for the day. Define, define a structure to model a film. Right? So a movie, film, whatever you want to call it. Right? So I'm going to go into code mode here. And oops, forget about Siri. All right, there we go. All right, now the way that you t uh, define uh, a structure is going to be very familiar. Type def, where have we seen that before? Enumerated types, type def enum. But in this case, we're trying to define a structure. Well. Again, 40 years ago, you paid by the uh, character, so we're not going to write out the full uh, 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 you know, keyword structure. We're just going to write out struct instead. Then I'm going to have an opening and closing curly bracket, just like type def enum. And I'm going to give my, uh, my uh, structure a name. Well, if it's going to model a film, what should I call it? Film, right? Should I call it films? Films tells me that there's like two or more, right? This thing is just one thing so far. Right? 
So if you had an array of films, sure, call that films or movies or something like that. Try not to pluralize things anyway, because uh, pluralization, you know, you get into, well, how do you pluralize in English, right? Uh, there are 50 different rules, and none of them are regular, right? OK, so there is my type def struct. Anything that I put inside here is going to be part of that structure. So now you help me. I'm going to crowdsource this. Tell me, what is a film? What pieces of data make up a film? Title. title. Okay. Title. Now, what is a title? So uh, I don't know. Uh, last movie I saw in the theaters was Joker. All right. So what? Joker. What is that? It's a string. All right. So how do I represent a string in C? Char star title. Now, unlike a, an enumerated type. An enumerated type is a list of things. So this, comma, that, comma, that, comma, that. This is a little bit different. It's going to be a semicolon after each one of these things. In general, the order doesn't matter unless you really care about what's called, I, I, I forget what the technical term is, but uh, packing or unpacking. Uh, if you want to optimize your code and save one or two bytes, then, then the order matters. Don't worry about that, though. Okay. I'm not going to save too many bytes. So we've got a title. Is that all? I mean, if that was all, then why define a structure anyway? Uh, you, you could just define an array of uh, the, the, the top 10 grossing movies of all time. That's going to be an array of strings. Right? So char, star, star. Uh, what else is a movie? What else is a film? OK, runtime. OK, runtime or genre. OK. Uh, what are those things? Runtime. A double? Okay, why a double? Uh, uh, I was like, well, it was an hour and 20 minutes with all the damn ads. So, uh, or no, it's two hours and 20 minutes with all the ads. Uh, but I think the actual running time was two hours, eight minutes, or something like that. Well, if I were to write that out, it would be like two hours, eight minutes. Right? That looks like a string to me if I've got a colon. What's another way that I could represent that, though? A double, like 58.5 and 58 minutes? Do we want to get that? If we want to get that specific, then yeah, the, the, this, this is the design process here, this back and forth. What, are our, what is our use case? What is our business requirement here? Do we need to be so accurate uh, so as to say that it's, it's 58 minutes and 30 seconds? I don't know. All right. Let's go with uh, runtime minutes or min. Right? Uh, that's kind of ambigu uh, ambiguous, right? Min <laughs> minimum runtime. Runtime in minutes. Right? I like that. And then it's an integer. It's a whole number. If you want to, you can go runtime in seconds. And then if you really want to, well, I want to know if it's 58 minutes, 32 and a half seconds, then, well, OK, fine. Go ahead and use a double at that point. I'm not going to get that, uh, that nitty gritty on this. Genre, what would that be? String? OK. I'll buy that for now. Semicolon, semicolon, semicolon. So when was Joker released? A couple of weeks ago or something, I don't know. Right? Uh, so maybe I want the release date. What is a release date? OK, so uh, release date year would be 2019. Release date month would be uh, well, it'd be, what is the month? October. So that could be like October or Oct or October. Or it could be 10, right? Yeah. OK, so I could use an array of integers. Like, how many are there going to be? If it's year, date, month, or year, month, day, is going to be uh, release, date, and three integers. OK. Or I could go three different variables, release, date, uh, year, month, day, right? or date. Uh, yeah, day, because I don't want date, date. That's weird. Right. Wait a second. What am I doing here in this exercise? I'm defining what a film is. I'm taking all the things that, re that, uh, that uh, a film is, and I'm putting them all into this one unit. What is a date? A date is three things. If something is composed of one or more or of two or more things, if something's composed of one thing, then go ahead and just use a variable for it. 
But if something is composed of two or three or four or five things, what is that screaming out to you? Maybe I need another structure. OK. So before I continue with my design of this structure, type def. Another structure for dates. Date. Right. Now what is a date? Now I don't need to, uh, now this, this, another, uh, another design principle here is, well, what about birth dates? If I want to put in an actor and give them a birth date, well, I'd probably be reusing this. If I want to release date and put that on a, a film, I'd probably use it there. If, I, if it has a use beyond, uh, another rule of thumb is that if it has a use beyond just get what you're immediately designing, you probably want to put that into a structure and reuse that structure everywhere else. That sounds familiar. If this piece of code is useful, that you use it, uh, so, so useful that you use it in at least two places in your code, put it into a function and call that function. Right? Same basic design principle. And it all, it's all the same basic design principle of DRY. Remember what that is? Don't repeat yourself. Right? So year, uh, I'll go with uh, day, month, and year. And I'll go ahead and make them all integers for now, uh, because that's, that's what I did up there. But does anybody have any alternatives? I could have a string character, right? Uh, like what, uh, what? What would it look like? That's a good question. Here, let's go. Uh, let's go up here. What would it look like? Uh, what is today? Today is 2019, 10, 30. How many people do their dates like that? Nobody. That's how you should do them. That's lexicographically correct. But nobody ever does it that way. I've been trying to get laymen out there, uh, you know, uh, the regular normies out there, to start using this because this is the correct way of doing it. Right. Europeans will do it how? Uh, day, month, year? Is it? 30, 10, 2019. Americans will do it. 10, 30, 2019. So already you see a problem here that what's our format if it's just one string? Right? None of these is the correct answer. Well, this is the, this is the least incorrect answer right here. But the real correct answer is going to be ISO 3601, is it? No. What is the ISO date format? I thought it was 30, uh, 8601. There we go. The real date format is something like this, where you've got the year, the month, the day, then the, a T separating to the time, a 24-hour clock with a Greenwich mean offset. Right? This is completely unambiguous. Uh, it can be made uh, to be accurate uh, down to the millisecond. Uh, you can uh, you even have atomic time with this and have it down to like the microsecond or something like that, whatever the, the standard date times are. But there's a standard for that. That standard is ISO 8601. So if I were going to do this with a string, I would do it with 8601, the sta 8601 standard. And at that point, I would say, screw this, and I'd bring in a library to do it for me. All right. What's another alternative, though? This is, this is what we're going with for now, just because it's simple enough. What about one number? What about int number of seconds since some epoch? What's an epoch? An epoch is like a, a seminal event, right? The, 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 the defining event or something. What is our epoch as far as computer science goes? The Unix epoch which is January 1st, midnight, uh, midnight morning on January 1st, 1970, uh, Unix time. There we go. Uh, do, I have, do we have a current time right now? No, uh, current Unix epoch time. Let's see if we can find, hopefully this has a live clock. Oh, it's not up, uh, okay, there, it, uh, there it's updating. But it's up only updating every so often. Uh, today, would be converted to this. That represents the number of seconds that have passed since uh, January 1st, 1970. Right? And it's completely un unambiguous. You, you could, if you wanted to, uh, make it uh, you know, halvesies, and then you can you have fractional seconds or whatever. But this is how Unix works. In fact, there's a problem with how it works. Uh, what, is the, uh, Unix, uh, what is the Unix epoch? Uh, where is it? Um, 
cry, uh, end, uh, error, uh, uh, maximum, nope. Where's the end, the end of the Unix epoch is some, uh, end of Unix epoch time. Eventually you're going, to, there, the year 2038 problem. So uh, by this time, if you have a Unix, you still have a uh, Unix pr uh, computer that is keeping time using only a 32-bit integer, there will be more than 2.147 billion seconds, or maybe it's 4 billion seconds, I forget which, an unsigned integer or something, since January 1st, 1970. At which time, it'll roll over and it'll become something like, what, uh, 1901 or something like that. That sounds familiar. Does it, do you remember the 2000 bug, right? The year, two, the Y2K bug or whatever they called it, where they only used two digits to represent the year. So when it went from 1999 to 2000, it all became 1900 again, right? The, unit, the year 2038 problem is similar in that you are eventually going to run out of bits to represent your time. Right? But uh, that's okay if you're on a 64-bit system because I think that you're all you're good until like the year three billion or something like that, I'm not sure. Right? Uh, and if you're still running Unix uh, three billion years from now when the sun has died out, uh, then you've got bigger problems than your clock rolling over. Right? So those are other ways of representing time. I will go ahead and simply represent it like this, okay? Uh, and instead of having release date, I will have, it's not an integer anymore. It's not a collection of integers. What is it? It's a date. Now there's a problem here. And if I put this into a compiler, you might see it. Uh, do I have a window open at REPL? Let's go with REPL. Oops. REPL C. And let's see if, uh, come on. Let's see if it compiles. Oh, no, it doesn't. It's complaining about it already. What, what's, what's it complaining about? Yeah, unknown type date. date right? Well, a compiler is stupid. It can only read from the top to bottom. Right? So if you're a compiler and you've only read up to line 8, have you seen any definitions for date? Nope. So what do I need to do if I'm going to use one structure within another structure? I need to be mindful of the order in which I'm defining these things. Right? All right, so if I put it first, then that will work. So let me go ahead and fix it over here. All right, there we go. And in fact, it, it fixed my, uh, uh, no, it didn't fix my, uh, uh, my, uh, my uh, the markdown typesetting here at all, unfortunately, okay? That's pretty good for now. Um, we've got title, we've got runtime minutes. You know what, I want one more thing here, just to show you that we have a variety, we can use doubles as well. Uh, box office uh, net gross. All right, there we go. Uh, now, is it a good idea to, uh, actually, should I just go ahead and round it off to the nearest dollar? Uh, forget about cents. Uh, I think it'll be okay for this one. How, I think it's grossed like 200 million or 300 million. Certainly no movie has ever grossed, uh, one individual movie has never grossed more than $2.147 billion. Now in the future, in 30 years from now, if movies start bringing in like $3 billion, can I use an integer to represent that? No. So let me just go ahead and future-proof this, and I'll go ahead and use a double. Uh, now you can earn $2.147 billion, okay? All right, and above that, whatever it is. That's a pretty good start on our design here. Right? Uh, any, uh, if you want to, you can go ahead and put in um, other things. Uh, I'm just going to keep it simple for now, and we're going to review each one of the design principles that I, uh, I implicitly was talking about here. So when uh, a, a structure can, uh, a structure is generally uh, um, composed of other uh, pieces of data, right? as many pieces of data as you want. When one structure owns another structure, it is referred to as composition. It is composed of another object. That, that object could be composed of another object. That object could be composed of another object. Uh, you can have arrays because, well, uh, strings are nothing more than arrays. They're arrays of characters. So if you want to, you could have a cast, right? A, uh, a, uh, an array of persons 
right? or person people that are, here's the cast, right? cast and crew. Right? And so now you can create an entire array of people. Well, and then you would need to define what a person is. And a person is a first name, a last name, some sort of an identifier, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So when you, ha you can have composition uh, style, not naming conventions right? in general. Uh, in general right? Now, this is for this class, and this is my own personal style. Again, if you want to de uh, deviate and go with another uh, style guide, that's perfectly fine. Uh, in fact, I, I think mine would not be uh, that nor mine would be modern, but not that normal, like for GNU style or something like that. In general, uh, 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 structure names are upper camel cased. Right? Uh, that's the more modern way of doing it. Uh, I, I, I'm taking that from Java and C Sharp and a bunch of other things. Uh, but uh, traditionally, it's all lower, uh, lower underscore casing. So, but you can go uh, one way or another as long as you're consistent about it. It doesn't matter. Uh, in general, uh, the members of a structure use lower camel casing. Right? And you saw that when I did this up here. I called it film, capital F. Uh, I had runtime minutes. Uh, runtime is one word, right? But if you want to, you can make it two words. Uh, but each subsequent word, box office gross, was capitalized, just like regular old variables. Okay. Um, in general, you declare a structure in a header file. Right? Uh, for example, if I were to declare this film structure in a header file, I'd probably put it into a film.h file right? uh, with the same name, because that's what it contains. Uh, structures that can uh, that 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 contain another structure. Uh, order matters. I'll, I'll I'll put it like this: order, a declaration order declaration order matters. If a structure uses another structure, that other structure must be declared first. Declared. Right. Okay. Well, we've got about 15 minutes left, unless you want to add something else to this. How do we actually use them in our code? Using structures. Right. So let me go back into code mode here. I want to create a structure, say, for the joker. Right. Film joker right. equals, uh-oh. Well, it's joker, and what, what else is in it? Uh, let's see. It's uh, runtime in the minutes, so that was 128 minutes, I think. Um, uh, what else? Uh, genre. Uh, I don't know. Superhero genre? Artistic superhero genre? You know what? I don't know. Let's go ahead and get rid of that. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll leave it there. Uh, just uh, since, since you, uh, you, you said genre, what is it? Spooky. <laughs> <laughs> Not exactly horror. Uh, when I read the reviews for it, they were making it out to be like this bloodbath. I'm like, nah, no, it's not. Right. Definitely are. Don't get me wrong, but I'm not going to take my kids to it. But uh, it's, it's it's no more violent than like AMC shows and stuff like that. Box office gross. I don't know. Let's say 200 million. Uh, 200. One, two, three. One, two, three. There we go. And release date. Does anybody know? I'll just say that it occurred on 10.1. Right? So does that look like valid C code to you? Am I going to be able to do that? No, I'm not. Right? So instead, my first attempt at this is going to be to show you another operator. If you've got a film, and the, fil the, the, the joker here, that's the name of the variable. If you wanted to call this f, then of course call it f. Uh, but I'm going to call it what it, what it represents. It represents the film joker. Right? What you can do to access the name of the film is using this operator here. This has a name. It's called the direct component selector operator. It has another name, a much easier name. What do you think it is? It's the dot operator. Right? So just call it the dot operator. Right? So joker, there we go. And then joker dot. Uh, what was that? Uh, runtime minutes is equal to 128. Joker dot 
uh, box office gross. Now I have to remember box office gross is equal to this $200 million here. Uh, and then well, what about the release date? Joker dot release date is equal to this thing. Release date is a structure. So if I've got a st another structure and I want to assign the year, what should I do? Dot year, another dot, 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 dot. This is a hierarchy, just like a file hierarchy when you move through a Unix file system. You start at the top, you go to a subdirectory, you go to another subdirectory, you go to another subdirectory. Dot, dot, dot takes you down the directory. Right? So the year was 2019, uh, the month, was 10 of October, and th even that's kind of ambiguous. Uh, do you start months at one and go up to 12? Okay, then maybe you want an enumerated type there. I don't know. Right. Joker dot uh, release uh, day. Does anybody know what it was? No, I'll just say one then. All right. Sometime this month. Who cares? Right. There. That's a huge wall of text, right? Uh, not only that, but there's a bug. Uh, what, what's that bug? Joker dot what? Oh, a name, thank you. Two bugs, title. Now what's the other bug? Same line, by the way. Can you do this? This is, this is, a, this is a string, right? Have I set up the memory for this string? What is it? It's just a pointer. What's it pointing to? At this, uh, at this line right here where I am? Big question mark, right? If I were to do this in that, pi in that code visualization tool, it'd be pointing to an, a poop emoji because it's, it's, it's an invalid pointer, right? So what do I need to do first? I need to allocate the memory. Joker.title is equal to malloc, or, or char star malloc, right? And how many, uh, how many do you need? Well, one, two, three, four, five times size of char. Is that correct? One, two, three, four, five letters plus one for the null terminating character. OK. Well, that takes care of, and then later on, if you want to print stuff out, you do the same thing. So printf uh, percent %s was released on percent %d percent D, percent D. And I'll, that's all I'll do for now, just the, the, the title and the date. Joker dot title, Joker dot release date dot year, <laughs> Joker dot release date dot month, Joker dot release date dot day. Wall of text, repeated, repeated, repeated. Type, type, type. Good strategy? Probably not. I want to do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten lines of code just to create a movie every single time I want one. Now I want to do 50 movies. Copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. No. So this seems, creating a new film seems like such a common task that maybe I want to define a function to do it for me. So let's do that. Defining factory functions. In object-oriented programming, these are called constructors uh, because you're constructing new objects. This is not an object-oriented programming language. I do not know if there is a, uh, an accepted uh, universal term for these. I call them factory objects. I've seen some people call them um, like instantiator uh, functions and a couple of other things, uh, creational functions, whatever you want to call it. I'm going to call them factory functions because if I've got this function and I give it the uh, attributes of a film and it creates a new film for me, a new film structure instance, uh, then what's it doing? Well, it's a factory. It's churning out these films. Right? So how do we do this? Let's go into code mode here. Oops. Ah, come on. There we go. So what I want to do is I want to create a factory function. This factory function creates a new film film structure uh, with the given parameters. Right? So I want to, I'll, I'll call it, I don't know, I'll call it create film. Right? What should it look like? Well. 
it's going to take each one of these things that defines a stru the structure, right? It's going to take the title, runtime, we'll simplify it and not do the genre, the box office, etc. It's going to take all of these things. The title, the runtime, we'll go ahead and forget about the genre for now, keep it simple. The box office gross and the release date. Okay, now this is getting kind of long, so one thing that you can do stylistically is just go to the next line. Align them up, and that's way more readable. Right? Uh, and then of course you don't want that semicolon right there. Okay, there. Uh, I, I really don't like this. Uh, let's see, what, mm, nope, not that. Uh, M, M, nope. I forget how to, uh, anyway, uh, it's not syntax highlighting this very well. You know what, let me go ahead and take it over to REPL where it will do a much better job of highlighting stuff for me. And then I'll go ahead and cut and paste it when we're done, uh, done with it. In fact, it'll also check my uh, uh, syntax along with me. So you want to create a film. What should the return type be? An int? Nope. Film. Okay, that will work, but it won't be ideal. Uh, if I, in, inside the function, if I create a film, f, and then you know I later fill it up with all this stuff, whatever, 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 and then return f, this will work, but it's pass, it's kind of uh, you remember passing by value versus passing by reference. You can also return by value and return by reference. So let's look up here at a film. A film is a date, which is three integers. Uh, another integer, so there's four integers. Four integers times four bytes, that's 16 bytes. Uh, a character pointer, two of those, so the eight bytes, so that's another 16 bytes, so that's 32 bytes so far. Uh, and maybe a couple, few more bytes, so 30, 40, 50, some, less than 100 bytes. Not that big of a deal, but you are copying 50 bytes onto the stack back and forth every single time. And if you're doing this hundreds of times, it starts to show. You start to, uh, to abuse the stack space. You start risking so many plates, so many dishes on your stack until it falls off. So you're abusing the stack by doing this. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to return by reference instead. I'm going to give you a pointer to this new film that's been allocated over there on the heap. Right? And then you, now you don't have to uh, copy paste, uh, like not copy paste, but uh, copy those 40 bytes or 32 bytes or whatever off the stack and onto an, an, uh, another thing. Right? Okay. So I'll have F here instead. How do I create a film dynamically? Well, I want to. If I anytime I want to create dynamic memory, what do I need to call? Alec. Okay, let's start filling in the blanks. If I want it to be treated like a film pointer, how do I need to cast it? As a film star. <laughs> I never got that. I, that, that was not intentional. All right. All right. How many bytes do you need? Well, I, I counted them all up, right? Uh, three integers, four integers, uh, two pointers, so. That's uh, 32 bits, right? So I just need, uh, what is that going to be, uh, four, uh, thir uh, 32 bytes or whatever it is? That's not, th that's not safe at all. That's really brittle because if I come over here and you know, add something else, int, foo, whatever, now it changes. Well, how many bytes did a, an integer take? Int. How many bytes does a film take? Size of film. That works because I defined it up here. Compilers are dumb, but they can go through and count things up. It says that there's one, two character pointers, and I know how big those are because of size of char star. Uh, date, well, I know what that is because it was defined up here. It's three integers. OK, that takes three times uh, size of int stuff. It's taking care of all that stuff for me. The only reason it's complaining here, by the way, is because of stdlib. Now it won't complain anymore. Okay. So what do we need to do to finish this off? F dot name is equal. In fact, I'm going to go over here and cut and paste what I was doing before. Film dot title. 
oh, uh, this is this is still a bug over here, but we'll we'll address that over here. Uh, film dot tight uh, uh, Joker, not Joker. Uh, there we go. All right, now it's complaining about this, but we'll talk about that in a second. Is this the proper way of assigning a string? What do I need to use? str, cpy, into title, the value, not joker, but the title that I was given up there, title. There we go. And now that's the proper way of doing it. Uh, of course, it's going to complain because I'm not bringing in the string library. And we'll do most of the rest of this stuff later on. But it's complaining. Why is it complaining? Yeah, f, f is no longer a structure anymore, is it? What is it? It's a pointer to a structure. OK, well, I can solve that by dereferencing f and then doing dot. But the problem is the same problem that some of you were having when you were trying to do the arrays and you had a pointer that you wanted to increment by one. or uh, uh, And so you did like uh, dereference. You did this uh, something like this, dereference the new size plus plus, And it wasn't working for you. Why? Because this has a different order of precedence than the, uh, the increment operator has a different order of precedence than the uh, dereferencing operator here. So it wasn't, it, it, we've, we've got a problem here. The, uh, the dot occurs before the dereference. So I need to put this into parentheses so that I can dereference it and then use the dot. That's a lot of characters. So C, giving us some syntactic sugar, instead gives us a different operator to do that hyphen greater than. That te the technical name there is the indirect component selection operator. But I think we can come up with a better name for it. The arrow operator, exactly. Right. Why? Looks like an arrow to me. Right. Uh, now, there is no left arrow, by the way. Some languages have the left arrow as the assignment operator, uh, one language that I can think of. Uh, but we don't have that here. This is less than and then minus, so A. Something like that will work in a logical statement because uh, you're asking is uh, b less than negative a, right? But that's not that's not a left arrow. In fact, that's an, that's a common bug that it's syntactically correct, but it's not getting them what they want because they think it's something different. So you don't have to dereference in parentheses and then use the direct component selection operator. All you have to do is use the arrow operator. All right, that's where we'll continue next week.